Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 217, featuring the second installment of my interview with Realms of Arcania creator, Mr. Guido Hinkle. Now, as you know, Guido has launched a new Kickstarter project. It's called Deathfire, and he's only about a third the way there. So please, before you even watch this video, head on over to the link in the show notes, make a pledge to the Kickstarter, know it's something you'll really, really like if you like the games we feature on this show. Anyway, in this part of the interview, we talk about Guido's uh, history, how he learned to program, and his earliest games. Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Guido Hinkle. All right, so let's go back to the very beginning of your career, because this yeah. it goes pretty far back, right? All the way back to at least 1983, right? When you started yeah. to get to program on your Apple yeah. II. Yeah. So I figured you must have been about 19 years old. You were working on these illustrated adventure games. So I'm kind of yeah. wondering what drew you, you know, why the Apple II, first of all, uh, and then what made you want to program this particular type of game? I mean, the Apple II at the time was the only computer I had access to. That, that was in, uh, in high school. And the thing was, we had a whole bunch of games there, among them the Infocom text adventures at the time. And I love that, you know, I love, I'm always, I've always been a book person. I love to read, you know, uh, I'm constantly devouring books. And uh, the Infocom adventures instantly appealed to me. So I kept playing them and eventually I got to the point, it's like, you know, wouldn't it be fun to do something like that? So I started developing my first text adventure on the Apple II taught myself assembly language. Actually, at the time, it was basic. But, you know, within four weeks, I had exhausted the entire memory with basic. It's like, okay, this is not going to fly. I have to find a different approach. And I learned uh, assembly language at the time. So I rewrote the first game, did it again, and eventually completed it. By the time I completed it, I had a VIC-20 at home, actually. So I thought, okay, let me redo it again for the VIC-20. And I redid it again, the whole thing. Uh, by the time I was finished, I had a Commodore 64 sitting on my desk. And I was like, okay, <laughs> maybe I should redo it again. And you know, so for, I was rewriting the same game four or five times. And on the Commodore 64, all of a sudden, we had all those beautiful graphics capabilities as well. And I, it got to the point, it's like, you know, I should probably add graphics because everybody was moving towards the graphics side at that point. And it's like, okay, you know, we, we do that. And... Uh, I, I changed Halloween once more and eventually pu had it published through a big major publisher, actually, back then in Germany. And it was fun. It was awesome. I mean, know. how did you learn how to do this stuff? And where were these computers coming from? You, it's, 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 really it almost sounds like they just sort of materialized on your desk. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's really self-taught, all of it. And how do the computers materialize? Uh, with a lot of savings, you know, <laughs> it's one of those things. Uh, fortunately, my dad was somebody who was high, really into technology. And when I approached him and said, listen, I'm spending an awful lot of time in the IT room at school and I would much rather do this at home. Is there a chance we could buy a computer? He was like, whoa, you know, where does this come from? And we were looking into it together and he's like, you know, it may actually be fun to have a computer around. And we bought a used VIC-20 at the time, you know, which was, which was fairly affordable at $1,000 back then. It was fairly affordable, you know. Uh, today, $1,000 for computers, people really frown. But, you know, back then, that was, the, that was the price, you know. That was your entry, your ticket of entry, and you had to pay it. Otherwise, you couldn't be part of the, you know, of the, the party. But it was all great. And uh, when, the, when the Commodore 64 came around, it was one of those cases where it was like, it's so much better, you know, it has so much more memory and stuff looks so much cooler that, you know, I just had to plunder all my savings and go out and get one. And, you know, it built from there. I, you know, I went to a lot of computers in those days. I mean, after the Commodore 64, I, I was also working on the Sinclair Spectrum for a while. I was working on the... Uh, I, after that, I switched to the Atari ST, I switched to the Atari TT, then I switched to the Amiga, 500,000, 2,000, you know, it went the whole range. Uh, I had an Acorn Archimedes at the time even, which was at the time the first ARM-based processor, uh, you know, computer, which was totally awesome. And, you know, then eventually the desk, uh, the PC started to really take hold in the computer games market and, you know, everything gravitated towards that, including myself, and we started making games for that. Uh, but, you know, all those different computers, it was fun. It was really cool, especially because you had to really dig into them. It's not like today where you have all those high-level languages and those high-level APIs. 
back then, you had to learn the hardware of those computers inside out in order to really do what it is you wanted to do. I remember on the Atari ST, I spent weeks trying to reprogram the graphics chip and, you know, do synchronize it with various interrupts, you know, it, it, just to get a split screen where you have high resolution at the uh, at the bottom and low resolution, but many colors at the top, all that sort of stuff. It was totally awesome. And I love that stuff. You know, I'm a total down to the wire kind of guy. And you said you were self-taught. I'm wondering, did you, was this all just on your own or did you have some friends that were also into programming and computers? Uh, I had a friend, I had a close friend in school who, and, and we met actually because he spent a lot of time in the same, you know, on, in the same Apple II group at school like I did. So that's where we first met. Then when I had a, a VIC-20, immediately somebody told me, you should talk to that guy because he has a VIC-20 as well. So, you know, we became very close very quickly and we both learned programming around the same time because together we played a lot of those games and uh, we both had that shared interest and we were like, wouldn't it be fun if we could do that ourselves? So I, while I was writing Halloween at the time, he was doing his own games and eventually after Halloween was finished and I was in the middle of working on Ooze, uh, we sort of decided, hey, why don't we throw in together and try to make bigger games because two guys just can do a lot more than one guy. And that's what we did. And that was really the beginning of Attic Entertainment Software, which would become the company that created and released the Realms of Wakenia games later. So he was my partner for many, many, many years. And yeah, it was this kind of relationship where we cross-pollinated each other, you know. And he was a hardcore role-playing guy, you know. In the early days, I had no idea what a role-playing game is. I was a text adventure guy, through and through. And he always kept going. It's like, you know, I had this role-playing group last night, and it was so much fun and this and that. You should join eventually. You should come along and try it out. So eventually I did. And we played the, you know, Das Schwarze Auge, which is the, the original uh, Rounds of Arcania pen and paper game. And, you know, I was hooked from the, from, the, from the first moment because it felt so alive. It felt so vibrant, so refreshing because, you know, even though you had a lot of rules in the game, as a player, you had all the freedom to do whatever you felt like doing. And after we, ha we had played a couple of sessions, you know, of course, the idea came up. How about we try doing something like that in the computer? And the first step to do that was, in, again, in a text adventure. We were together working on a text adventure called Drachen von Lars, which was never released outside Germany, unfortunately. But it was a fantasy text adventure with graphics. And what we did was we infused it with really minor role-playing elements. Your characters had stats, for example. You played two guys in the, in the game, so you could switch between who you want to play. That was the first step towards party-based game for us. Each of them had stats. One of them was a magic user. One of them was more like the warrior type. So they could use different items that they found. Uh, one was a spellcaster. The other was not. And combat, we had well, already at that point, we had a turn-based combat simple, uh, uh, system in there. Very simple, completely text-based. The parser would ask you, what do you want to do? And then you say, swing the sword, you know, bam. And then, you know, you would go through the combat round by round. You would deal damage and eventually you would kill the monster and gain experience for that. So those were the early steps. And once that game was finished, we said, you know, I think it would be fun and it is time to really create a full-blown role-playing game. And at that time, The Bard's Tale was our big, you know, game to look up to. And interestingly enough, it is also how I met Brian Fargo at the time, because we made a game, it was called Spirit of Adventure. And we, you know, like I say, we were highly inspired by The Bard's Tale. So there was a trade show in London. Well, and speaking I'm of, sure <coughs> just huh? a second. Well, speaking of highly inspired, wasn't that the one that had the, the drug addiction and... Yes, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that was the one. Yeah. Uh, the whole story revolved around drugs in that fantasy world. It was cool, you know, and it was a totally different theme for the time. Nobody had covered anything like that. Like, that would be kind of unique, you know. You're trying to root out drug dealers in a fantasy world. It's like, yeah, cool. And like I said, the game had a strong Bard's Tale feel to it. So I was showing it at a trade show in London at the time. And this guy walks into the booth and says, hey... I'm Brian Fargo, and I really like your game. I was like, whoa, that is kind of cool. So that's how we met, and that was, you know, what, 25 years ago, something like that. So that, that, that lead to some publications through, I guess that might have laid the groundwork for your later 
Absolutely, uh, absolutely. I mean, that was one of the reasons why I talked to him later and said, you know, I'm moving to the U.S. And, you know, Interplay is one of the companies I really consider I would like working for. And, you know, they pitched me uh, the, the, the Planescape Torment design document and said, here, take a look at this. And I loved the, the concept. I loved the idea behind it. I said, yeah, I would like to commit to that. Let's do this together. You know, I accidentally left out a viewer question here. <laughs> we sort of answered it already, but uh, this is from Mario Zamek. He wants to know, what were your favorite games to play during the 80s? So I guess we've mentioned the Infocom games and uh, yeah. uh, Bard's Tale. Was there anything else? Um, I, for some reason, it's it's totally weird, but there, for some reason, there's one game that I always remember. It was called Forbidden Forest. Oh, I, yeah, Paul Norman. But I cannot, you know, and the funny thing is I remember that game mostly for its music. It's not so much the gameplay itself or anything, but the music. I love the music in that game. And even these days, you know, I would go on YouTube and seek it out just to listen to it again here and there. It's, it's just something you know, that burns itself into your mind, into your conscious, and you can't get it out. And it's like, yeah, that was one of the really fascinating games. But in those days, I really played literally anything that would come along. And we were swapping a lot of games in those days, you know. Like, <laughs> you know, we were kids in college and high school. We didn't have any money. So, yeah, uh, you got this copy? Yeah, you know, let's trade, let's swap and all. So we got to see a lot of the games out there. But... Uh, aside from the Infocom adventures, I I also loved what Magnetic Scrolls was doing back hmm. then. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, the but they pawn had these gra and, uh... Yeah, exactly. They had those graphic adventures, the Pond, Guild of Thieves, and all that. And I thought those were absolutely amazing. In many ways, I think they were superior to the Infocom games, uh, not only in their visual presentation, but even in terms of the parser, in terms of you know how they approach certain subjects and all that. So I loved that. You know, I was a huge fan of those games. I'm wondering, how do you compare the computer scene and the gaming scene in Germany uh, compared to what was happening in the U.S. and maybe even in the U.K.? Interestingly enough, they're very different worlds, really. And it's, it's kind of astounding. At the same time, I understand why it is. And in the early days, for example, in the 80s and the, the early 90s, the U.K., for example, was completely focused on shoot-'em-ups. Everybody was just making shoot 'em ups. If you looked at companies like Hewson, Ocean, and all that, uh, all of them, they cranked out one shoot 'em up game after the other. Psygnosis, for example, you know, high quality shooters, but usually not a lot of content. So they were extremely driven by the technology behind it. Uh, in the U.S., you had those bombastic uh, developments, you know, you had Wing Commander, you had Origin going all the way out, you know, these kinds of things. You had Sierra with their huge adventure games and all. And even games like the Wizardry series became bigger and bigger and everything. So there was really this tend to make things bigger and more colorful, more gra graphics heavy and all that. The Americans always pushed the envelope in terms of hardware and all that. You know, every time when Origin came out with a new game, you knew you needed a new computer. Uh, whereas in Germany, I found that the focus is mostly on actual gameplay. It's not so much how much you dazzle them, how much bells and whistles you put in it. It is how much attention you pay to the detail. And that's why in Germany, there's a really strong market for strategy games, for the kind of trading games, you know, where you uh, where you build stuff up slowly, uh, tycoon games, these kinds of things have a very strong following in Germany. And I think it just has a, a history in, in the culture itself, you know, traditionally Germany is just very, I wouldn't say restricted, but people have a tendency to really get into details, to really, I don't know really what the word would be, but... It's a different mentality. It's not as outgoing, as open, you know, free-flowing as it is in the U.S., for example. Uh, it's just a very different culture that comes from a very different background. There's probably some German word that doesn't have an exact translation, right? That just yeah, nails yeah. it. <laughs> kind of related to this, I'm wondering if you had the same Atari ST versus Amiga rivalry. <laughs> in Germany? Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. You know, and you know all those those rivalries in the sense, you know, on one side they're fun to watch. At the same time, in many in many aspects, they're so moot 
Because, you know, if you buy one computer, you know, buy it, be happy with it. Why do you grudge, begrudge somebody else that he has that computer versus that computer? I don't think there is a better or a worse computer. Uh, it's more the experience of what you're getting out of it. And even these days, you know, I mean, of course, you have the differences between Windows and the Mac these days. And I am a huge Mac supporter. But I do that uh, mostly out of my own conviction because I love working on the Mac. Mac but if somebody enjoys working on a Windows computer, all the power to you, you know, I couldn't deal with it. But if it works for somebody else, you know, fine, fair enough. Uh, but yes, we had huge rivalries. And it wasn't only the Amiga and Atari camp. Earlier, you had the Commodore and the Sinclair people, you know, who, who completely <laughs> bashed it out. Yeah, that exploded into gang violence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in the UK, it might have, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of. Uh, I was thinking about John Romero when I had him on the show. You know, yeah. He had the same sort of contention that we really lost something when we lost all these different platforms because each yeah. one, it wasn't just a different company or technology. It was actually a different style, a different yeah. feel to them. I mean, would you kind of agree with that? Oh, absolutely. You know, and it's also because each computer required a different design paradigm almost because there are some computers you could do it on other computers you could not do certain things so you always had to keep in mind what platform am i working on and how can i achieve it if you had certain games for example and that goes back to i spend a lot of time also doing contract work in those days porting games from one computer to the other so i would oftentimes get an amiga version and i had to port it over to the atari and the atari was much more limited in graphics capabilities so you really had to step back and think about how am I going to do this? How am I going to relate this to the player? And it was really a very different approach. It is a little similar to what you have these days between, let's say, the tablet world and the desktop world. If you want to put a game out on the iPad, it requires a very different strategy, a very different thinking, because it's just under you know the, the expectations of the player and the way you play games on a tablet just are very different than you have, you do with a keyboard and a mouse. So I always thrived on that. I always enjoyed that tremendously. It's also one of the reasons why I went into the mobile space for a long time, because with each handset, you know, you had there, you had to virtually start over again and think, what can I do and what can I not do? And you had a spectrum that ran from your black and white little Nokia phone all the way up to the pocket PC that ran Windows, you know, uh, how are you going to bring them all together, you know? So you had to sort of build different versions and iterations of the same game, focusing on different aspects to make them work. And like I say, I thrive on that kind of challenge. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a programmer at heart. I love the analytical part of it, that you really have a problem and you sit down and break it down. It's like, how am I going to achieve that? And then you try to pull out some magic bunny out of the hat and say, you know, Maybe if we go around this corner and back in this way and all, then we make it happen, you know. And because that's how we did it in the eight, uh, in the old eight and sixteen bit days, you would completely abuse the hardware. Uh, like I said, on the on the Atari, for example, we would use certain timers and certain ports in the in in the chips uh, that were never designed or never meant to be used that way. But as a side effect, we often notice, hey, if I put a signal on here, something happens. The screen starts to flicker. Hey, wouldn't that be a cool graphics effect? You ping, ping, you know, you just create a, a flash of lightning. Not a graphics effect. You just ping the hardware real quick and the whole screen flashes. These sorts of things, you know, it's getting completely out of the box and coming up with totally weird ideas. And I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, me too. I was a. I don't know how to make a transition back to this, but you know, I didn't want to talk about <laughs> about this game Ooze Creepy Nights. Yeah, you know that's really. I was laughing really hard when I was reading the. It, it, I thought it was a horror game. Then I started to read the description of it, and this, you know, Uncle Burgers and you know yeah. stuff about hamburgers. I mean, what yeah. what the heck's going on with that? You know, it was. I mean, I was young in those days. I always have to point that out. You know, when I wrote that game, I was maybe. Yeah, I think I was 18, 19, something like that. So, yeah, you know, some of the humor is juvenile. I completely agree, you know. And I was sitting there. I had to come up with names for the characters. And I was like, okay, what do I call these people? Hamburger. So, okay, his dad or his uncle is cheeseburger. You know, makes kind of sense. So, you know, I went into that game like that. And in those days, you know, we didn't really take ourselves seriously at all. We were just having fun. 
And even to this stage, you know, we're just making games because it's fun, you know. If you look at game developers, many times they're so put on the pedestal and whatever we do is take it, you know, it's looked upon and it's 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 evaluated by a certain standard and all that is like we as developers usually don't look at it that way. We're just trying to have fun. We're trying to do make games because we enjoy making games and we we use whatever we have at hand, skill wise and resource wise many times, you know. Oftentimes if something doesn't turn out the way that players may expect it or want it. Oftentimes, it's because we didn't have the resources or because we didn't have the talent to do it at the time. It's certainly not that we go in there and say, you know, this is a feature that will completely annoy players. Let's put it in, you know, that kind of... Nobody does that. Nobody wants to create a bad game or something. You're just doing the best you can, and then it goes out to the public, and the public evaluates it. Actually, I have to correct that. These days, people even judge it before it's even done. Because with the Internet Society, things have changed so much. Now you even you just put a, a single sentence out. It's like, I'm going to make this kind of game. And immediately, you will get a response. You know, there's a lot of people who may say, this is cool. And you will also get a lot of people who say, this is complete crap. You know, so uh, I don't even know how we started this. <laughs> Do you feel like I you have a, like, I got a pretty thick skin now for that? You have a thicker skin now than you did back then for stuff like that. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I like to think so. Let's put it that way. You know, I mean, it's always hard to deal with negative criticism, or especially if it's unwarranted. You know, I can I can easily deal with constructive criticism, even if it's negative, because if there's some validity to it, if there's some truth to it. I will readily admit, and I will be the first one to admit, it's like, yeah, you know, it sucks. I mean, the other day I was playing Rounds of Arcadia, the Shadows Over Riva, because I just wanted to get back into it to see what did we do back then. I loaded up the game, and I started playing it, and I'm running around there 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Nothing happens. I was like, whoa, that was a really bad design decision, you know. You leave the player stranded entirely with no clue what to do. You're just, really, you're swimming. And I was like, no, that was really bad. And I'm the first to admit, you know, that was a really bad design decision. So this time around, I would do that completely differently. But, you know, if, if people point something like that out to me, I have no problem with it because I, in, on many levels I agree. It is really just when people start to make... Uh, to trash talk you and to really get uh, try to get under your skin for that particular sake, uh, that it sometimes becomes a little hard to swallow. But you know, my mentality usually is you know, out of out of sight, out of mind. I try not to respond to it. I was reading that interview you posted on your site, and you one part of it talked about how you were the guy that picked up the phone when somebody had a problem with the games and you would learn a little bit about game development that way, just from the feedback. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's a natural progress. Uh, no, it's, it's, a not, no, it's a natural process. And the more feedback you get, the more sides of the story you get. It's like I said earlier with history and all. <laughs> I thought I saw a wasp. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully right, it wasn't. <laughs> let's start this again. I think it's a natural process, you know, the more feedback you get and the more sides of, 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 of the more sides you see of how people play and uh, interpret certain things that you do, the more you understand where they are coming from. So it sort of influences how you start thinking about games. It doesn't necessarily mean that it completely changes your focus or that you really change all your decisions just because a couple of people say, I don't like this. But it makes you think about it a little harder sometimes. And you go in and you look at it, it's like, okay, if I were the person who doesn't like that feature, what would I have to do as a designer to make them appreciate it? What would I have to do to make them understand why it's there? Because oftentimes it's really just a matter of that they don't really see a purpose for it and then say, you know, it's just a bad decision to have that in there. So, you know, all these things get into your mind and you, you just become more conscious, more aware of certain issues. And then you try to work them in and see if there are perhaps solutions to make everybody happy.
that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Guido will be returning next week for a third installment. Probably have at least two or three, maybe even uh, four more installments left to go. It's well over two hours of material. Uh, we're going to get. We haven't even gotten into the realms of Arcania games yet, so uh, stay tuned. Lots of great stuff coming up. As always, I want to thank you if you've supported this show. You can do that by going to matchat.us. Look for the support the show uh, link there. You might also want to poke around the matchat.us site a bit too. Got some great forums and even uh, some games I created up on the site. Hopefully, more of those coming soon. Uh, what else? Oh, uh, of course, uh, don't forget to pledge to Guido's Kickstarter. Hopefully it'll still be, uh, I should have the new episode up before it's over, uh, but I can't make any guarantees, so whatever you do, if you haven't pledged to this, if you have any intentions at all of doing so, uh, please do it right away. Uh, it's, you know, good $200,000 left to raise at this point. Every little dollar helps. And even if you don't or can't pledge to it, it makes a lot of difference just uh talking about it on a forum, posting about it on Facebook, you know, anything you can do to spread the word is really helpful. And I really want to see this game get made very, very badly. It's the only uh, CRPG with turn-based, a uh, party creation, and rat factions. So I'm behind it 100%. Okay, uh, what about that ale of the week? Well, you guys had so much fun with my pronunciations last week. I found another German ale. Uh, this one's even more intimidating than the last one. <laughs> As far as I can tell, the name of this is something like Hechterflurranschbier. I think that's how you pronounce that. I'm pretty sure that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, and that's about the only words I can read on this bottle. Dim Bear something something. Original Schlerkurla. Schlinken. Schlinken. No, Schlinken. Okay, forget it. Uh, smoke beer. <laughs> smoke, smoke beer. Okay. It is a product of Germany. Uh, let's see. Oh, English on the back. Thank you. Um, okay. Echt Schlucken Schlinkerle Urbach is the complex sibling of the classic Mürzen smoke beer. Exactly like the classic, all its barley malts are smoked over beech wood logs. Its higher smoke malt concentration and lower, longer <laughs> maturation in the 1700 year old cellars underneath. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Okay, so they put it in 700-year-old cellars underneath Bamberg. Uh, this creates a taste profile of the most intense smokiness, beautifully balanced with deep malt sweetness. So, I don't know if this is a, it sounds like, kind of like a cigar in a bottle, I don't know. Anyway, let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this Schlinkerla smoke beer here in the rather excellent drinking horn. A little worried about sniffing this, snorting this stuff. It's got a quite a strong aroma. I swear to God, it's like smoke coming out of this, this horn right now. Anyway, let's uh, kind of take a, a cautious whiff. Ah, you could definitely, you know what, this smells like a very strong sort of bourbon, uh, uh, sort of bourbon meets burning cask. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it smells like it's on fire. I, I kid you not. This is kind of got a charcoal like uh, quality to it. Kind of a beefy smell too, like burning beef jerky. I guess that's kind of what it smells like. Uh, whew, uh, this is going to be, <laughs> I'm sure this will be quite a pungent experience anyway. Uh, let's get it over with. Uh, toast to you, Guido. <laughs> What the <laughs> hell does that taste like? Um, it does sort of get a beef jerky-like taste to it. It's sort of very high, uh, like taste. I think my vision is getting cloudier as we speak, and maybe that's the smoky part of this. Uh, just haven't tasted anything like this before. I don't even know how to really describe this. Let me try it again. <laughs> I don't know how to describe that. You know, I guess if you took a bunch of beef and you had it soaking in some water uh, for a long period of time, maybe, and then added a little bourbon to the mix, and then uh, put some charcoal in there, <laughs> maybe that's sort of what this tastes like. I gotta say, not a big fan of the flavor of this at all. It is uh, quite distinctive though. I'll give it one more taste. Yeah. <laughs> 
that's pretty damn nasty. Ugh. I guess it's definitely an acquired taste. Uh, it's smoke, smoke beer? Okay, it lives up to that. It is <laughs> quite smoky. It's like you've been hanging out around the barbecue pit a little bit too long. Uh, not, not a lot of uh, flavor going on there besides that sort of smoky, a little bit of bourbon-like flavor to it. I'm going to go, uh, I guess, one out of five drinking horns on this. I'll give it the one drinking horn just because it is unusual. So if you like exotic flavors, uh, you should look for this one. <laughs> Otherwise, i got to say, I don't think I'll be buying a six-pack of this stuff anytime soon. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, the quotation this week comes from a, an American author named Albert Hubbard, which I thought was appropriate for uh, this episode. And uh, the quotation goes something like this. To avoid criticism... Do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. See you guys next week. You know, there's some things I forgot to tell you guys, and they're really important. Number one, he hates bright lights, we know that. But you gotta keep him out of the sunlight. Sunlight'll kill him. Number two, keep him away from water. Don't give him any water to drink, and whatever you do, don't give him a bath. And probably the most important thing, don't ever feed him after midnight. <laughs>